Um, today I'm going to be talking about the cells and organs of the immune system um, and uh, kind of do, giving you sort of a cast of characters of what we're going to be talking about um, throughout aspects of the rest of the semester. So um, before I get into some of the details of um, the cells of the immune system, I want to make a couple of quick points about microorganisms, um, given that much of what we're going to think about with immune responses will have to do with defense against those microorganisms. And I give us um, a few different quotes from uh, varied sources about the importance of understanding one's enemy. When we are thinking about um, microorganisms, there are four major sort of groups that we tend to be thinking about. Um, there are some examples of each of them shown here. Um, so we have bacteria um, that can be uh, potential microorganisms we're thinking about. We've got viruses. We have fungi. Um, which, of course, remember, can be either unicellular or multicellular, although typically when they are in um, the human body, they tend to be more in the yeast or unicellular form. Um, and we have a variety of eukaryotic parasites. Um, sometimes we talk about protists that are eukaryotic parasites. Sometimes we'll actually talk about some that are multicellular, like different types of parasitic worms, things like that. Um, most of the time, um, I am going to be thinking about bacteria or viruses because those are the ones that I think about the most. Um, and there are some reasons why um, those are particularly common, though, especially with a couple of the points I'm going to make today, I do want to highlight a couple of details regarding some of the others. And there are some times when some of the other organisms will come up. Um, so in order to think about how we might have um, some defense against these organisms, um, and I'm just going to say organisms, I know we can debate what's up with viruses and what is the right term for viruses, and I'm just going to say organisms for now and leave that aside. Um, there are a few kind of things we should know about those entities or those enemies um, in trying to think about how we are going to set up a system of defense. So one of the things that I wanted to briefly point out has to do with um, growth rates. This is a very simplified version of a bacterial growth rate. Um, those of you who've taken micro will have seen this before, um, where you can see number of bacteria on um, y-axis, time on the x-axis, and you can see, particularly in log phase, how quickly we go from about 100,000 bacteria up to a billion. And you can see that that's happening in the span of hours. Um, typically, we think, we'll talk about sort of a very standard organism like E. coli, and we will say that the generation time of E. coli, the time it takes to go from one cell to two cells, is about 20 minutes. So that's how long it takes for a new generation to happen. And you can imagine that that's going to be important for us to know about because the immune system is probably going to need to fight back. It also tells us some things about how um, if that organism were to pick up some mutations to try to get around the immune system, how quickly it would be that it could have another generation um, that might have these new mutations. So we'll say bacterial generation time, 20 minutes. That's very average, but that's what we need for now. Um, okay, so uh, when, how long does it take for humans to have another, to have a progeny, another generation? Yeah. So nine months of gestation and in life, like 20 something years between generations. Right. So um, we are not out reproducing bacteria ever. 
They are always going to win if this was simply who's going to reproduce faster. If we are fighting against bacteria and we both try to make a mutation to win against the other one, the bacteria is going to have progeny way before we will. In fact, by the time we can have another generation, you know, those bacteria are going to have reproduced basically to infinity um, and have like eaten our resources out of us, out of house and home, use up all the resources. I remember learning something in some biology class that if you like had bacteria um, with no constraints on resources, just growing, it was a some shockingly short amount of time, like 30 days where you get like a sphere as the size of the earth that was growing at an infinite rate. Um, like they're going to win. <laughs> and one thing that we are going to have to think about is sort of this numbers problem a lot. If you imagine that you get infected with one cell of a bacteria, you are going to be trying to deal with potentially in hours, many thousands, millions of cells real quickly. Um, and you might say, well, Dr. Barker, your, your comparison here of a generation taking like 20 years, that's not exactly the best comparison. You should actually be comparing, um, how quickly a human cell divides, not how much, how much time it takes for a human organism to divide. Um, and um, for a human cell to undergo one cell cycle, um, this is sort of standard textbook answers. I actually read this paper in the past year that like challenged us, and it's like the coolest paper ever. We might be talking about it later in the semester. But anyway, the, the, the textbook answer is it takes 24 hours for one of your cells to divide. So even there, bacteria are just totally blowing you out of the water. And we're going to have this numbers problem. In fact, um, you'll see a little bit later today, um, this is kind of what we think of as a very classic type of immune response. I'll define this immune response a little bit later. Um, but you can see that this is where we might be getting infected with something. And you can see that, in fact, we start to really make a particularly good response at like 10 days. If there was, if honestly, if nothing was happening in 10 days, the bacteria would win every time. Because they just reproduce so fast. And so this numbers and reproduction problem is one problem we're going to have to think about. Um, I'm showing you this with bacteria as an example. Um, if I actually switch this to viruses, it gets even worse in terms of numbers. Another general thing that you're going to want to think about has to do with size of microbes. So here you can see those different types of microbes that we mentioned before, viruses, some different types of bacteria, fungi, and parasites. And you can see that they range quite a bit in size. Our cells are sort of in this range of sort of large fungi to the parasite size. There are outliers among on these things as well. But before we think about the outliers, what you might imagine is if you think about those viruses, they are, say, one tenth, one one hundredth, one one thousandth, one ten thousandth the size of our cells. The way you deal with a threat that is one tenth, one ten thousandth the size of you is very different than how you deal with a threat that's the same size as you. A lot of times people think about Pac-Man with their immune system. We're just going to go around and eat everything up, right? If it's little, it's pretty easy to go eat it up. If it's big, you're not going to eat that up. And let me show you again as an outlier, as an example. This is Ascaris. This is a parasitic worm. This came out of someone's intestine. Those are hands holding this that just came out of someone's intestine. You're not going to phagocytose that. Phagocytosis is useless against that. And so what you might realize is, again, we're going to need slightly different kinds of defense to deal with some of these different organisms just based on their size. We also 
can think about where those microbes live. Are they outside of our cells or are they inside of our cells? How you try to destroy something that's inside of one of our cells, like this virus that's reproducing inside of our cells, is going to be very different than how you might try to destroy something that's outside one of our cells. And so when we're trying to divide up different cells, different parts of the immune system, things like size, things like where the microbe is, the location is going to become something that's really important. Um, we can also think about whether those microbes are different than our cells. Are they going to offer unique targets? Um, are they, remember that we're talking about these immune cells here who are going to be using, you know, some kind of receptor perhaps to find a microbe. They don't like have eyes and brains and super complicated ways to know whether something is our cell or not. We need to think about this in sort of biochemical terms. And so some microbes are pretty similar to our cells. Some of them are really different from our cells. Which ones are going to be more similar to our cells? Might you think? Or which ones might be more different? And again, I'm thinking like bacteria, fungi, parasites, viruses. Why? Yeah, both fungi and protists are eukaryotes, as are we. And so, in fact, it's actually much more challenging for the immune system to find targets that are unique than, say, a prokaryotic cell that is going to have a relatively different biology and have very different targets. And so, again, that's a place where the immune responses may differ based on just how unique those targets are. The final place where we're going to see a lot of um, sort of things to think about has to also has to do with those targets. So imagine that the immune system has some way to distinguish a target on E. coli versus ourselves. Remember, E. coli is um, replicating very, very fast. We talked a little bit about growth rate. So it also realized that that means that it probably has the ability to pick up mutations in its new generations a little bit quickly. And so we can also think about what's the mutation rate of some of these microbes versus the mutation rate that we have. How much do those targets stay the same? Or how much are those targets shifting around in terms of something we need to detect? Because you can imagine if you're trying to detect the bad guys, the bad guys keep changing what they look like. That's going to be a little bit of a problem. Just to give you a brief example on this one, um, this is sort of one of the, my favorite examples to think about. Um, this is uh, sort of general information about HIV. And again, this is the point here is to give you an example. The genome of HIV is about 10,000 base pairs. Um, and the mutation rate of its polymerase is one out of 300,000 bases. So you might be like, Psh, that doesn't sound like anything. It's totally fine. Well, in a person who's infected per day, they make 10 billion virus particles, which means 10 billion copies of that genome. So you could take 10 billion and multiply it by 10,000 and find out how many new base pairs you get every day. And then you could divide that by the mutation rate. And if you did that in total, you would find out that you get 333,333 mutations made in that virus a day. Notice that that is more than the size of the genome. So basically every base pair in the genome changes every day. This should tell you that the immune system is not trying to always deal with very fixed targets and has to deal with shifting targets. And so that's something else that we're going to have to be thinking about. Um, one of the ways that this type of thing is actually dealt with actually goes back to what I said before about how fast these microbes reproduce. 
one of the things that the immune system just tries to do is reduce this number. We can make it so the number of progeny is less, then our life gets easier. As I mentioned last time, the immune system is really this interconnected network of a lot of different cells, organs, molecules, and things like that. Immunologists really like to try to make up sort of classification schemes for aspects of the immune system. And so in starting to kind of tell you who's who and what's what, I'm going to be using some of those classification schemes. The first classification scheme that we can think about is that immunologists often divide the immune system up into layers. And there are three major layers shown here. Um, one layer I will call the barrier defenses. One layer I'm going to call an innate immunity. And one layer I will call adaptive immunity. Technically, there are some people who talk about this thing called intrinsic immunity. Um, frankly, I think about it a bit in my research or arguments about some exact details of it. But in some ways, it's kind of a barrier defense. But it kind of straddles the line between barrier defense and innate sometimes. Um, so immunologists actually talk about it less than virologists do. But I felt like because it may come up in a reading or something, we'll put it there. Um, you may have previously heard about acquired immunity. Acquired immunity is the old term that is now adaptive immunity. Um, and in fact, um, so I, I had to make that switch in my nomenclature in 2002. So part of me is always like, how are people even still saying acquired? Acquired is so wrong. Um, whatever, it's fine. Um, but there are a lot of reasons why adaptive fits what's going on much better. And we'll see that uh, as we go forward throughout the semester, why adaptive immunity is a much better, um, better term. Um, what's nice here is you can see that all of these layers are acting together to protect the organism. Um, they all um, can have some very important uh, impacts. And so I want to kind of give you a little bit of definition of each of these layers. The barrier defenses or barrier immunity um, involves a lot of things that people don't usually think of as being part of the immune system. So some of the things that we think about as being the barrier defenses include things like the skin. Um, in a lot of ways, we can think of the skin as one of the largest, is really the largest immune organ because it is this nice layer that's keeping stuff out. It's sort of a way that we keep things out, keep those numbers of microbes down, because only a smaller number of them can get into the body. Um, we also have things like the low pH in the stomach. Um, we have things like cilia in the lungs that are going to be trying to sweep um, particles out. We have um, secretions that are coming from some glands to flush out different organisms. None of these things are specific to good or good microbes versus bad. They're honestly about pushing down the numbers and keeping microbes out. They are providing a barrier. If you don't believe me that skin is an important organ of the immune system, um, then you can talk to patients in burn units. Um, the biggest problem with most patients who are in the hospital for burns is actually that they have lost their barrier and they get a lot of infections because they don't have that barrier defense. Um, within those barriers, we do have, you know, the physical barrier, which I think is what people mostly think about is this physical wall that's blocking different uh, organisms from coming in. Um, but we also do have some chemical barriers like, say, low pH in different parts of the body that may um, deter microbial growth. 
it turns out we have learned a lot more about the fact that we also have a layer of microbes in most of our barrier organs that are commensals. They are living there, providing potentially some benefit. They're getting some nutrients from us. And they're basically keeping the niche filled so that if any other microbe tries to come in, the niche is full. Sorry, can't live here. Um, and so they're helping us quite a bit in that way. And that's something that we've been learning more and more about in recent years. And so in some ways, they are part of our barrier defense as well. We'll talk a little more about some aspects of barrier immunity a bit later in the semester. Um, it's sort of a very hot area of immunology right now. Um, but the next layer that I want to mention is the innate immune layer. And to be honest, this is one place where sometimes I, I say our, our categorization is a little sketchy, only because some of the things that are chemical barriers, you could maybe say are innate instead of barrier. Um, so whenever every textbook I look at, uh, when I look at their barrier defense section, and I look at their chemical barriers, I'm like, yeah, but not that one. That one's this one. So again, the immune system doesn't know that it's supposed to be being a barrier right now, and now today it's being innate. Um, the, these are lines we have drawn. And so some of these chemical barriers, one could argue, are part of the innate immune response. Um, so we can talk a little bit about the innate immune response. If you look at the syllabus, you will see that on Friday, as well as next week, we're talking in much more detail about innate immunity. Um, and so right now, I'm kind of giving you the like, this is the definition of innate immunity level. And we're going to see much more about some of this same information later on. Um, the other major layer that we will see is the adaptive immune response. I'm pointing them both out right now because on the next slide, I'm going to be showing you sort of a compare and contrast between the two. This is the compare and contrast between innate and adaptive immunity that's coming from your textbook. Um, there are similar tables in pretty much every immunology textbook. So I'm really going to be describing this. There's one thing here that's phrased funny, but whatever. They all, someone always phrases it weird. Okay. Um, and so one big difference between innate and adaptive immune responses is timing. How quickly following the um, infection or the exposure to the microbe does that type of immune response kick in? The innate immune response can be immediate. Usually, I think of the innate immune response as being all you got for the first 96 hours. The adaptive immune response is the one that's a bit slower in days to weeks. When I showed you that little graph earlier, that was really a graph of an adaptive immune response, which is the one that people are more familiar with. So it's the one they usually think of. Um, it's slow. But what you might realize from what I was just telling you about numbers issues, if it was the only game in town, this would never work. We definitely need to have a fast response to help us make sure that those microbes don't reproduce too quickly. Um, the other kind of biggest, well, these are the other two that I would say are the biggest um, variables as well. One of them that's listed here is it says limited number of specificities versus numerous highly selective specificities. Um, you can also see we've got this fixed versus variable. If I'm going to phrase that in my own words to explain what they mean by that, um, the idea with the innate immune response is that the innate immune response has a smaller number of targets that it recognizes. And it doesn't always recognize the target super specifically. For example, if we were looking at things in terms of an adaptive immune response, 
I would say, I have detected Ashley. If I was looking at something with an innate, the way an innate immune response might do, I would say, I found a brown haired student. So you're kind of putting things into sort of broad classes instead of actually being super specific. That's kind of what they mean by limited number of specificities by numerous um, highly selective specificities. For some reason, the phrase immunologists love to use is the exquisite specificity of the adaptive immune system, whereas the um, innate immune system is a little more broad in what it's recognizing. And that's actually kind of what they're trying to get at with fixed and variable, too. Um, with the um, adaptive immune system, the other big piece is that the adaptive immune system, oh my gosh, adapts during the course of the response. So it gets better. The second time you see that same microbe, you are going to have an improved response. Whereas the innate immune response is going to be the same every time. So you're going to have this response that's quick, that's kind of general, that's going to be the same every time, versus a response that is a little slower, but is really, really, really specific, and is going to have the ability to improve. And those two really have to work together in order to make this whole system work. You can see examples of um, the timing as well as that improvement in this image. So here you can see what can happen with an infection um, in one time and a, then a second infection with the same thing. The lighter blue is the innate immune response. So you can see Early on, after this first infection, the innate immune response is the only thing that's doing much. And then later on, the adaptive immune response finally gets its act together and starts to participate. The second time around, you can see that the innate immune response looks basically identical to what we had the first time around. But now the adaptive immune response is bigger, faster, stronger, great. Um, and so it has adapted. Um, so those are kind of going to be key features. When we divide up the cells in the immune system, a lot of times we talk about cells that live in the blood and cells that live in tissues. The cells that live in the blood are much easier to study than the cells that live in tissues. For example, you right now have some immune cells that live in the wall of your intestine. If I wanted to measure some things about your blood immune cells, I could take a little bit of blood and then run down to my lab and do some experiments. How would I measure the cells that lived in the wall of your intestine? Well, first I'd have to take a biopsy of your intestine and then I'd have to pick apart the walls and pluck out the cells, um, and I'd get like two, and do my experiments. And so we do a lot of stuff. A lot of our thinking about immune cells has to do with thinking about blood cells. And so when I classify the cells of the immune system, I'm largely going to tell you about the cells of the blood. I will make some mention about some other cell types that are in tissues. But oftentimes, at least to start with, we think a lot about the cells of the blood. And we can divide up those cells of the blood. One of the big types of cells that we see in the blood are red blood cells. I know that's a shock. <laughs> blood, of course, is red. <laughs> um, we also have platelets. Um, platelets come from another cell type called megakaryocytes, so I've got them listed together. But really, our major players in the immune system are known as leukocytes, or white blood cells. Cytes on the end mean cells. Here, leuco is white blood cells, erythro is red blood cells. And so, here we are really going to be talking about the leukocytes. You can see that we can also divide up the leukocytes into some groups. When we look at all of these different red blood cells or blood cell types, 
we can see that there are a bunch of differences between them. So this is one table. Here is a zoomed in version. The following slide is the same table, a little less zoomed in. You can't read all the, you don't have all the columns here, but it's easier to read. So what you can notice, first of all, is there are big differences in the frequencies of all of these cells. So in a cubic millimeter, there are 5 million red blood cells, but there are only 7,300 white blood cells or leukocytes. And that some of them, like a basophil, there might be less than 100 of, while there were 5 million of the red blood cells. So you can see big difference in how frequent all these cell types are. Here we can just look at the percents of leukocytes, and you'll see that some of the leukocyte types are very common, while others are very rare. Um, that will um, be related to some things I mention about them later. You can also notice that if we look at the lifespan, of all of these different cell types, um, they range pretty dramatically. So you can see some of these cells um, live for 120 days. Um, here you can see lymphocytes last uh, living for years. Um, this, that cool paper I was telling you about before actually was trying to get at lifespan of lymphocytes, and they had them living for 10 years, and then they like needed to finish graduate school and end their experiment. So apparently the word on the street is that the cells are still alive in that lab and like someone else has moved on to the project, but they published it with them living 10 years. Um, so there's a huge range in that way too. So as much as we're gonna sort of limp, lump these together as the cells of the blood, we can realize that there are um, some big differences. One reason why we think a lot about this as the cells of the blood and why we start here is because all of our, all, this is the other problem with immunology. We keep describing really new and cool things. that are almost like slight exceptions to the rules. So I feel like there's so many times in this class when I say something and my brain is like, there's an asterisk to that. So all of the cells of the immune system, asterisk, um, come from the same place. And so they all start out coming from the same place in development. And that's one reason why we link, link all of these together, even the red blood cells, which really we're not going to say much more about this semester. All of these cells come from the same kind of stem cell during development. That stem cell is known as the hematopoietic stem cell. Um, hema is blood. Um, the process of making blood is hematopoiesis. So this process is known as hematopoiesis of the development of blood cells. This is the stem cell for hematopoiesis, the hematopoietic stem cell. Um, immunologists also love to put poiesis when they mean development of something. Um, and I, part of the reason is because poesis is from the same Greek root as poetry, and it means to make or to create. And the number of times I've had to read things where people are like, let me tell you about the poetry of blood cells. And I'm like, mm, I've only heard that joke like 500 times. Um, so that's why people always go with this. But the hematopoietic stem cell can develop into any of our other cells of the immune system. It can also develop into red blood cells or platelets, though, like I said, I'm not going to say as much about those. And so one of the ways that we divide up our blood cells when we're thinking about them is kind of which branch of development did those cells come down from the hematopoietic stem cell or the HSC. And it turns out that those branches that we see here actually have some important biological differences. 
so I, I guess I'll go back here first. You can see that this table talked about cells as being either myeloid cells or lymphocytes. And if we look at our hematopoiesis diagram, lymphoid, like lymphocytes, and myeloid over here. Again, it's those two basic branches. Here's the version that your textbook does of this, where it basically says there's two branches. There's the myeloid branch, and this figure is telling you more about the myeloid branch and where it goes. Or there's the lymphoid branch, and it's like, I'll tell you about that later. The myeloid branch are all the cells in the innate immune system. And the lymphoid branch will be all the cells of the adaptive immune system. And so this um, distinction is actually um, pretty important biologically. Um, you can see that the red blood cells are part of this myeloid lineage, but I'm not going to think about them more. <laughs> Um, you can also see that we've sort of got some other branches coming off here. When I think about those other branches, I really think about two branches. Um, and part of the reason I think about those two branches is because even in our big picture <laughs> way of drawing up, of dividing up blood cells, Two of the branches are right here really easily, one called granulocytes and one called monocytes. So um, to me, when I think about that myeloid cell differentiation, I'm thinking about, okay, so we go from overall cells to either myeloid or lymphoid. And then when we're in myeloid, we either go to granulocytes or monocytes. You can see there are different types of granulocytes. Monocytes are kind of all lumped together. Um, and you can see that our types of granulocytes are called basophils, eosinophils, that's spelled wrong, there should be a P, um, and neutrophils. If you notice, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes are pretty different in terms of their frequency in the blood. Neutrophils are super common. They're the most common white blood cell. Eosinophils and basophils are super rare. Monocytes are kind of in the middle. So as I mentioned, one of these groups of cells broadly is called the granulocyte. See, granulocyte. Granulocytes got their name because when you look at them under a microscope, they're full of little dots or granules. So the point, so the idea with granulocytes is that when you look at them, you can see little compartments inside the cell under a microscope, which are the granules. And basically they differ based on what's in the granules. So, you, so here you can see granulocytes are the innate immune cells, or myeloid cells, that have granules. We've got our three different types of granulocytes shown here, the neutrophil, the eosinophil, and the basophil. Um, the purple here um, is binding to DNA, it's binding to the nucleus, and so one thing that's also super weird about these cells is their nuclei are wacky shaped. They have like weird little lobes. It's not like a normal looking nucleus. Um, so we see neutrophils. Sometimes we'll see eosinophils. They have a different chemical composition in their granules. Um, and then basophils, which also have a different chemical composition in the granules. Um, in the blood, neutrophils are very common. Eosinophils and basophils are quite rare. This does actually have um, some other thing that's kind of important biologically. When I run a lab section of this course, lab one is actually looking at blood cells under a microscope and finding some of these cells. And whenever we do it, it becomes drama because no one can find a basophil. <laughs> 
And only a few people find eosinophils, but nobody finds a basophil. And everyone gets all excited and they think they found one. And I look and I'm like, no, no, sorry. But, and, and if you notice, basophils, when I showed you the numbers, are the ones that are super rare. Eosinophils are not quite as rare. Neutrophils are all over the place. You find a neutrophil, like, without even trying. And I say, well, it's kind of good because this is actually blood from a donor. It's good that you can't find a basophil. It's good that you let them keep their one basophil. Um, in their body instead of donating it to you to go on your slide. That also um, is important because there are so few basophils and eosinophils in the blood that it is really hard to study them. Um, in particular, basophils. There are so few of them, it's very hard to get enough to do experiments. And so for a long time, their function was unknown. Um, and there are still some places where some details of basophils are sketchy. Um, so what you can see here is that your book lists them as controlling immune responses to parasites, and that is true. Um, but I'm not going to really go into tons of, like, specific, more detail about exactly what's going on there, because we don't know. Um, eosinophils also have important roles in killing parasites. So I want you to think about those parasites like that parasitic worm that I showed you that was huge. The thing that these cells can do really well is that they've got all these little granules. You can see all the little dots. And it turns out those are all full of toxic stuff, which they can secrete out of the cell. They can basically shoot at that big worm and try to kill the worm. We're never going to phagocytose that worm. We're not going to eat the worm. So we're going to shoot bombs of poison at it and hope that those bombs of poison are going to kill it. And all of these little dots that you can see are different types of components that could be that bomb of poison <laughs> that we're shooting. Yeah? So that's a great question. Um, I'm going to answer that question on actually the next slide regarding neutrophils, and then I will sort of come to the eosinophil answer. And the reason why I'm doing that is because we know less on the eosinophil side than we do on the, uh, the neutrophil side. Um, so neutrophils, on the other hand, will perform phagocytosis and uh, killing of microbes. So their job is really to, um, they are Pac-Man. They're the ones that are going around doing phagocytosis. If you go on YouTube and you search neutrophil phagocytosis, you will find a video of a neutrophil chasing around Staph aureus and phagocytosing it. It is probably the most famous video in all of immunology. I've seen it so many times, sometimes I root for the bacteria just because I'm like bored of seeing the same thing. Um, it's on YouTube a million times. Um, people have set it to like any music you want. So like people have it set to like the cops soundtrack of like the cops gonna get you and all that kind of stuff. Like if you can think of it, there, that version of that is on YouTube. Um, and it is a neutrophil doing its phagocytosis. Neutrophils are very common cells in the blood. And if you have an infection, particularly a bacterial infection, and you go to the doctor and get a complete blood count, get your white blood cells counted, they're basically doing this. They're basically figuring out the percentages of each of these cell types. And what they will see with your neutrophils in that case is a dramatic increase. So you will have way more increase. So if you have too many white cells, your doctor tells you that's really because you have extra neutrophils. And that's happening in response to infection. And so we can think about why did the neutrophil number change in response to infection. Um, the answer is that there are a ton of neutrophils actually that live in the bone marrow. And if we start to sense a need for neutrophils, we will release more neutrophils into the blood in order to combat that infection. I think, so I know that in the case of a parasite infection, eosinophil, eosinophil numbers shoot way up too. And so I think it's the same thing. I think it's also released from the bone marrow, but I have spent less time thinking about that situation. <laughs> um, when talking about granulocytes, there is one other cell type I should mention. Um, when your book does its little hematopoiesis diagram for myeloid cells, it puts this cell in a slightly different place than I think of it 
as going in, it's okay. We're not going to like get super stressed about it. In any case, I'm going to tell you it's a granulocyte, but it's a granulocyte that lives in tissues instead of in the blood. Um, so this is called a mast cell. And you can see the mast cell, again, has all sorts of granules, but it might live in your skin. It might live in your lung. It's not circulating through your circulatory system. It's spending its time in some kind of tissue. Um, so it's really a granulocyte that lives in tissues. There is uh, there are some people who think that mast cells are actually grown-up basophils. Um, and you can actually see that mast cells, they have all these granules, and if, you tri if they get triggered, usually by a parasite, to release those granules, they will release all those granules, they don't have them anymore, and they're shooting that toxic bomb out. I do not like mast cells one bit. Because not only do mast cells play a really important role in doing this exact process to um, kill parasites, they also are do this process to result in allergies. And so when I can't go outside in the spring, it's because my mast cells are doing the wrong thing. The other big type of um, uh, innate immune cell or myeloid cell that we're going to talk about is a cell type called a monocyte. For our purposes, I'm going to use the terms monocyte and macrophage interchangeably, although technically they are not interchangeable. Technically, um, the monocyte is what's in the blood. The macrophage is what happens if it leaves and goes to the tissue, but they kind of can switch back and forth. Um, and these are also white blood cells that are going to do a lot of phagocytosis. Neutrophils and macrophages are both cells of the innate immune system. They can both do phagocytosis. They do both have some unique functions that we'll talk about when we get to um, more detail of innate immunity. But for now, we've got our sort of monocyte macrophages as our other innate immune cells. Um, and you can see that these cells are the ones that are kind of in the middle um, in terms of frequency. They're not the super rare ones, but they're not the super common ones either. Yeah, Kyra. Sorry, what, um, did you say they were both part of the Yes, yeah, so every, so I have not yet introduced an adaptive immune cell. Everything's in eight. So, okay. Um, just like with the granulocytes, I mentioned that there are some that don't hang out in the blood, that hang out in tissues. That is also true when we're thinking about sort of monocytes and macrophages. And there's one cell type that is related to these guys that is an innate immune cell related to a monocyte, kind of from the monocyte lineage that's in tissues. I'm basically pointing it out here to tell you its name. People get freaked out about this. Don't get freaked out about it. We're going to see so much of this cell later. <laughs> um, but this cell is called a dendritic cell. And dendritic cells are really cool because they're innate immune cells, but a big part of their job is turning on the adaptive immune response. Um, so um, I often think of these as sort of one of the options for a monocyte when it grows up. Um, also, I found this image online because I don't love the image they show in your textbook of a dendritic cell. Um, and just look at that structure. Now try to imagine that moving through the blood. One thing that we actually find is that all the cells that are in the blood are pretty much perfectly spherical. So that when like fast moving blood flow goes by them, they don't get ripped in half. That would get its arms ripped off really easily if it was in the blood. <laughs> um, but in the tissue, this is really useful. Um, it was called a dendritic cell because early uh, microscopists thought it looked sort of like a neuron with dendrites. It has absolutely nothing to do with the ner nervous system. It's not at all the same. Um, that's that. Um, and so those are the myeloid cells, which are those innate immune cells. And this is one sort of arm of development from the hematopoietic stem cell. The other arm of development from the hematopoietic stem cell is the lymphoid lineage or the lymphoid cells. 
And so here now you can see the myeloid cells and they're not zoomed in. And we're zooming in on what happens from the lymphoid progenitor. Um, the lymphoid cells are the cells of the adaptive immune system. Um, sometimes we refer to them as a group as lymphocytes. You should be careful with that term. Lymphocytes means these adaptive immune cells. Leukocytes means all white blood cells. Lymphocytes are a kind of leukocyte, but they're not all of them. They're just one of the many kinds. Sometimes students like to switch around those words or get confused with those words. So you want to be clear about the difference between leukocyte, which is all white blood cells, and lymphocyte, which is one kind of white blood cell, specifically the ones that are part of the adaptive immune system. Um, what you will notice is that we can have a lot of different types of lymphocytes. So you can see we go to a ton of different branches here. Big picture, what I will tell you is that we've got B cells and T cells. And anything above that we'll deal with later and, and sort of how we further can distinguish those cells. You can also see I couldn't resist. I had to put the asterisk at the top because there's asterisks here as with everything else. Um, you can see some of those lymphocytes in terms of what they look like, um, like under a scope here. Um, so they don't have the granules that you saw in the granulocytes. They basically just have a normal looking circular nucleus, some amount of um, cytoplasm. So they are pretty easily distinguishable microscopically. Um, and lymphocytes are the second most common white blood cells after neutrophils. Remember, though, all of these cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, are all your innate immune system. Just the lymphocytes are your whole adaptive immune system. So that kind of tells you those cells must be pretty strong if you need so few of them compared to all of these others. So those are the cells that we have in the system. But we also can think about the immune system in other ways. And for the rest of the time today, I'm going to be talking about the way we think about immune organs. Um, and I may not get all the way through, but we'll get at least partway through. We'll finish the rest of it on uh, um, Friday. Um, so with the immune system, there are a lot of organs that we can think of as being related to the immune system. This is a figure from your textbook showing you some of the um, organs that we can think of as being part of the immune system. And just like with all of the cells of the immune system, we have a, a way that we divide up the organs. And so we divide up the organs into either uh, primary, secondary, or tertiary. Lymphoid organs. And so as we think about these organs, what's really important as we think about them is to know, is that organ a primary, secondary, or tertiary? And what the heck do those three terms even mean? You can see that there that there's some color coding here. And we've got two organs that are shown in red. The bone marrow and the thymus. Those two organs are the primary lymphoid organs. Here is yet another figure of the primary lymphoid organs, our thym the thymus and the bone marrow. Um, Note that the thymus is probably the one you're less familiar with. It is a small organ that actually sits on top of the heart. Sometimes people want to confuse it with the thyroid, which is up here in the neck. The thymus is actually down on the heart. So here is the thymus. Um, and then the bone marrow is inside all of your bones. The definition of primary lymphoid organs or what's going on with primary lymphoid organs, is that this is where all of the cells of the immune system develop. So that hematopoietic stem cell 
comes from bone marrow. And it becomes all of those other types of cells I just told you about in either the bone marrow or the thymus, depending on the type of cell we're talking about. So the primary lymphoid organs are where we make all of these immune cells. Um, they have interesting structures that we can see microscopically um, with different areas where the different developing cells may spend some time. Um, and that's really the role of these organs. Um, if you've heard of people having a bone marrow transplant, the reason why you're getting a bone marrow transplant is because something happened to your immune cells and we're trying to give you more hematopoietic stem cells to restart making immune cells. We're basically giving you some more primary lymphoid stuff to rebuild an immune system. The cells, or the, the organs that immunologists think about most frequently are organs known as the secondary lymphoid organs. Um, there are a lot of secondary lymphoid organs. They are shown in yellow here. The two that are sort of the most famous are lymph nodes and spleen. Those are kind of the big ones. Um, I will often use either lymph node or spleen as an example. In my mind, for a lot of ways, uh, at least for today, they're interchangeable. I will get into what's different about them probably Friday, but I don't think I'll get there today. Um, as they're both just an important secondary lymphoid organ. There are some others like the Peyer's patches in the intestine, um, like the appendix, like the tonsil, like the adenoid. Um, but usually when I think of a secondary lymphoid organ, I'm thinking about the spleen or the lymph node. And to understand what's up with the secondary lymphoid organ, I have to tell you a little uh, additional um, kind of anatomy and physiology types of material. And I will also point out that this is going to be an immunologist view of this. Um, I'm sure that people who study certain other physiological systems would look at this and be very sad. <laughs> what I told them. Um, okay, so to start with thinking about this, I want you to think about um, liquid that is getting pushed through a tube by perhaps some really strong faucet or pump. So think about what happens if you um, turn on, open up like a, a hydrant, a fire hydrant, and have all the water come out. Or you turn on your hose, your garden hose, to full blast. Okay? So you've got a pump, something that's pushing liquid, and you've got a tube with water. Okay? That's kind of how immunologists like to think about the circulatory system. <laughs> so usually I would draw a little heart here. <laughs> it's a really big pump pushing liquid through a tube. <laughs> okay? Starting from the aorta and then going through arteries and arterioles. I want you to imagine your big pump and your tube, your tube with all the liquid in it. What would happen if you took your tube of liquid, your fire hose or your garden hose or whatever you're imagining, and you squeezed it. Yeah. It blocks the flow. Okay. So we're not going to have flow anymore. What else might happen? Yeah. You might have, what will build up? The liquid and what will build up because of the liquid building up? Pressure. So you're going to get pressure build up. Anything else might happen? Like, would that pressure build up? It could explode. You could get a great big, like, ball. You know, you can imagine, like, the garden hose bunching up behind where you're squeezing it. You could eventually imagine explosion, right? You can, you can imagine all of this happening. Okay, so I'm basically going to go with my big pump, pushing my blood, and then I'm going to get smaller and smaller vessels. I know about you, but if you look around the room, no one has exploded while we've been sitting here. So clearly, this is not going to be sufficient to explain everything that's going on. But if we look at sort of a simplified view of the circulatory system, there should be explosion. So why is there not explosion? What happens 
so that we don't explode. Yeah. Yeah. So it turns out that everything at the sort of first half here, all of the arteries, arterioles, what have you, have permeable walls. As a result, the liquid can leak out, and that equalizes the pressure. Um, I remember when I first learned about capillaries, learning like they're so small, one cell can fit in them, it's one cell at a time. It's also just like one cell left at that point, because all the liquid has been forced out. So we're going to force the liquid out to get rid of this pressure problem. And it's actually pretty cool because we force the liquid out of the vessels and say some liquid gets forced out here in my arm. Well, now those cells of my arm get like water and nutrients and stuff, soaking them. And that could also be a way that they could put their nutrients out in that liquid. Technically, the A&P term here is interstitial fluid <laughs> is the name for this liquid that's outside of your vessels. OK, but there's another problem. And I'm going to sort of mention a couple things about this problem, then we'll pick up with the rest of this on Friday. So what's the problem with now our scheme as we have it drawn? We've got all this liquid leaking out. We've normalized the pressure. We are no longer going to explode. If it just worked like that, you would be job of the hut. Because you would just have all this liquid going everywhere around your body, and you'd turn into a blob. You need a way to collect the liquid back and get it back into the blood instead of just becoming a great big blob. So here you can see we've got our arteries, and you can see this liquid is coming out of the arteries. We have a second circulatory system that actually picks up the liquid to bring it back and keep us from being job of the hut. And that second circulatory system is called the lymphatic system, or the lymphatic vessels. Um, and so we're going to start on Friday talking about the lymphatic system and the lymphatic vessels, what they're doing with this liquid, and how that kind of ties into secondary lymphoid organs, um, which are part of the lymphatic system. Um, so I will see you guys on Friday. Have a great next couple of days.